Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, and Chris Smith, plus our brand new patrons. We got four of them today, folks. X, Dave, Kyle, and Damon. Yay! Yay! On this episode of DTNS, NIST says to stop making people do complicated things for passwords. Gmail gets smarter reply suggestions. And Jason Howell joins us to report on the new Google TV streamer. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 27th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. I'm Jason Al, the other tech titan in Petaluma. I'm nowhere near Petaluma, but I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, Jason Al, it's great to have you. Thank you for being here. What's up? Thank you for the invite. I always love to do it. What is going on? Uh, listen, folks, we're going to have a wonderful show, so just sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. We start with the quick hits. The Irish Data Protection Commission, or DPC, has fined Meta $101.5 million for violating GDPR rules by storing passwords in plain text. The fine comes after the conclusion of an investigation into a 2019 security breach, which showed as much as 600 million passwords were stored in easily readable plain text, dating back to 2012. The DPC also found that Meta failed to properly notify the commission of the breach and did not properly document personal data breaches relating to the storage of passwords in plain text. Meta was also found to have violated GDPR by not implementing adequate technical measures to protect users' passwords from unauthorized access. Of course, Reuters reported Thursday that Sam Altman might get a 7% stake in a newly organized open AI that would have uncapped profits and be a public benefits company. We talked about that here. Well, open AI CEO Sam Altman told employees at an all hands meeting, quote, there are no current plans to give him a stake in open AI. At an interview during Italian Tech Week, he said regarding reports that open AI was considering reorganizing into a for profit public benefit company, quote, most of the stuff I saw was also just totally wrong. But was it all wrong? Mm -hmm. So you're saying there's a chance. Mm -hmm. Following a number of disappointing box office performances for several big budget films, including Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon and Fly Me to the Moon, Apple's Hollywood studio is refocusing their pro uh, movie release strategy. Instead of theater premieres, they'll be releasing them on Apple TV+. Plus big surprise plans to re uh, release wolves that's a action comedy starring george clooney and brad pitt two very very big hollywood stars in theaters globally has been canceled and replaced with a limited run in a small number of venues before releasing on apple tv plus on friday bloomberg sources say arm you know, the, the chip designers made a high-level inquiry about buying Intel's product unit. If you don't know Intel's product unit, it's the part of the company that sells the chips. You know, the ones inside your PC or maybe your server and stuff. That would have left Intel with its foundry business, the part that makes the chips. Intel turned down that offer, saying that the division is not for sale iFixit has published the results of its teardown of the iPhone 16 Pro models. Those are the newest ones. The Pro models' batteries have an enclosure to prevent you from accidentally puncturing the battery while conducting repairs. The biggest news from the teardown is that the 16 Pro has dual entry, meaning you don't need to remove the screen for all repairs. And as long as you're using OEM parts, you can swap them out freely without worrying about Activision locks. iFixit gives the iPhone 16 Pro models a 7 out of 10 for repairability, up significantly from the 15 Pro's 4 out of 10. Ooh, look at, look at Apple go. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, sets technology standards for the U.S. government, and therefore anybody who wants to do business with the U.S. government, and therefore actually has some influence on standards in the entire country and sometimes beyond. NIST just released its second public draft 
of a revision of the digital identity guidelines. These are the things that NIST says, we'd like you to do this, you have to do this regarding security. Now, it is a large, sprawling, mostly incomprehensible to most people uh, piece of documentation, but in there, it proposes borrowing, barring the following practices. Uh, mandatory resets, you know, that thing where every three months they're like, you need to change your password. You've had the same one for three months now. Uh, you can't do that if you want to play ball with NIST. Required or restricted use of certain characters, like special characters, and the use of security questions. The what street did you grow up with? Okay, great. We'll let you into your account now uh, kind of questions. I love this because none of these are good practices. They're all annoying to the end user and they don't actually increase security. I mean, isn't all secu like security levels to a certain degree annoying because they put a barrier between you and the thing yes. that you want to do? Correct. But I would agree a lot of these the thing is we've been doing a lot of this stuff for years. Like how like decades actually, like what what was your first pet? That is a question that I feel like has been part of the kind of security, you know, uh, <laughs> protocol yeah, yeah. for so very long. And every time I do it, I'm like, you know, like I'm a podcaster. I'm pretty sure like at some point along the line, I've probably mentioned some of this stuff that they're asking me to use. Um, it's so eminently you have to go fishable around it and, even like, if you're not a podcaster. Well, right? It, yeah, yeah. right. It, it's like, you know, first pet or what was the name of your, you know, where you went to kindergarten? Or, yeah, right. You know, what was Who the was color your of your first house? Or... Yeah. You know, mm. that sort of stuff. It's You're sort of like, well, nobody would really know that. But that's all stuff that is fishable. It's mm -hmm, not only fishable; sure. it's also guessable. Like you can yeah. brute force attack that stuff. I, I hate. I, I think about this every time one of these comes up, and they make me do it. Which is okay. You just made me choose an exclamation point, a capital letter, and have a sixteen uh, <laughs> thing long password. But anybody who who can brute force a dictionary word is allowed into my account with this security recovery. Uh, my tip to people is don't answer them accurately. Uh, it takes a little more record keeping. Keeping, but mm -hmm. use a long, secure password to answer what was your first pet. It's not guessable. You'll have to remember it. True. Uh, but that way you're not leaving your account insecure. I like that NIST is saying, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Your kindergarten don't friend who's like, yeah. I know I know the answer. She will not be able to brute yeah. force uh, your... Oh, that person. I think one here I that mean... might surprise people is choosing uh, special characters not being allowed because that sounds like it would be like, oh, doesn't that make the password more secure? Uh, turns out if the password is sufficiently long and random and random is the key there, uh, it doesn't. Special characters offer no benefit over other characters. Uh, and requiring them actually weakens the passwords because of human behavior. Because humans don't do random, uh, usually what happens, everybody uses an exclamation point. And so it becomes easy to, easier to crack your password because you just look for exclamation points and you get rid of all the special characters. If they're truly random and long, uh, then it's very difficult to guess whether there's a special character in there or not. Yeah. I actually had to, I, I had to reset a password uh, recently. I don't remember if it was for a bank account or something else, but um, I was using LastPass, um, you know, just like, give me, give me a password. Don't even want to know what it is, you know, and yep. then I'll save it. And, you yep. know, that's what I'll use uh, going forward. And it was like, nah, no, no, you're using, um, you know, certain uh, non, you know, alpha, uh, alpha <laughs> Right, sometimes they don't characters. let you use the special character. Where I was just like, oh, all right, so keep going, yeah. keep going, keep uh -huh. going. And, and like finally Bingo. it worked where I was just like, <laughs> oh man, you know, like it's like I was giving you the best password possible and you were like too secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too secure. Yeah. yeah, it gets super good. Like, Yes, the password managers have helped. Like they've certainly helped my password kind of health over the last decade, let's say, since I've been using them. But still, I encounter those sites where, you know, the, like you're talking about the rules, right? That you were talking about there, um, Tom. And like it's almost like I can't put in the rules into the password manager because they're all different. They're and so I different. do have to yeah. do that dance where it's like five different back and forth before I finally kind of yeah. find the one that works. It's it's frustrating. The uh, proposal also requires a minimum password length of eight, but suggests the like it should be 15. 
You have to have eight to do business with us, but it yeah. should be 15. And they say, don't set a maximum little. length. And if you do set a maximum length, it has to be 64 or larger. But they're like, there, there's no reason to stop people from putting in characters because people won't put in so many characters that it'll overflow your database. I guess malicious actors might. So maybe there's, you know, a maximum of 100 or something. But um, yeah, this these are these are good standards. Uh, and it, it makes me wish for the day that pass keys become so widely acceptable they are easy because... They don't yeah. make you think about anything. They just make they uh, once they are widely adopted, they'll just be stored on your device. We're not there yet, though. They, they, Listen to they recent make Android me think about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they I don't mean, make you we, think as much as this, right? Well, I mean, to a certain degree, I mean, yes, this kind of stinks when the I'm pass creating key is the a password. New password. You don't have to. Say. You don't have to think about what's in it. It's just a matter it depends of where on the device it is. I'm using. Though sometimes it's just really unclear, like exactly the right way. And then when I go through the process with the pass key, it still says, "Oh, well, that didn't work. What do you want to do now?" I'm like, well, I guess I'll just use yeah, the password. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, that's the implementation. <laughs> what I'm saying is yeah. the pass. Key, you don't have to come up with the pass key. No, that's right? true. I see. That's, I understand that, where you're coming from. And you I just think, can't lose the pass key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you and lose that's it, you need to, that's a. You whole need to have other other account recovery or, options for a yeah. while, but eventually, yeah. eventually, that th this will all work itself out because sure. it has all the same disadvantages of the passwords, except for the it's not fishable and you don't have to worry about coming up with it parts. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know, I think I think it'll get there. I have faith. I also have faith that uh, I will no longer have to think about what goes into an email now, Sarah. Yeah. So, so Google, uh, if you use Gmail, which many of us do, introduced smart replies in Gmail. This is powered by Gemini large language models stuff. Unlike previous versions of what Gemini would do for Gmail, these new smart replies are designed to consider the full context of the email conversation and with effort to sound more personal, of course. The updated options are available to users with a Gemini business, enterprise, education, or education premium add-on, or a Google One AI premium subscription. I have none of these things uh, currently. Um, so this is not something that uh, I can take advantage of. However, more and more of my friends say, oh, yeah, I mean, just to, you know, to, just to kind of like fire off an email and have the AI clean it up and, you know, send it to the team. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Jason, yeah. I, how much are you, are you using this? Well, so, okay, so I do have a Google One uh, AI premium subscription. I checked this morning for this feature, and, and Google even said this is rolling out over the course of the next 14 days. You know, I have the right things marked, but it's n still not appearing to see. I mean... Have I used smart replies before? Absolutely. The real short hits, like when I'm in a hurry and I just need to like say say throw a quick confirmation and I don't want it to just be yes or whatever. You know, yeah. I might hit the, yeah. the four word version Thanks. of yes. And that's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I don't want to come off curt, but I don't have a lot of time to do much more, so I'll use it. Um the when it gets to writing an entire email. You know, there's going to be very, for me, there's going to be very specific circumstances that I feel comfortable doing that. And it's, it's almost like if I'm, if I'm on a, in a personal kind of, uh, relationship with someone, I would feel weird constructing an email and sending it to that person. And it, that person might never know, but for me as a human, like it's hard for me to well, remove and, myself and from that And let's experience. say you sent that to me. Maybe I yeah. do know, like Jason was in a hurry. I get it. That's not yeah. really his, his voice, but like it kind of sucks. It doesn't serve the purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the flip side, right? Like it, getting that, that message, especially if you can, can kind of pick up on the fact that it might've been generated, it does have that, like that sting of a lack of authenticity or genuine. Right. Like that I wasn't give you an worth of that his person. time. At the same time, on the flip side, sometimes communication just like it, that stuff doesn't matter as much as did it get the point across. And to that perspective, that's that's where I start to think there might be certain circumstances that I would use this when it matters less about that kind of personality perspective. Yeah, and yeah. I just want to like get the point across. Fine. It's right, very you contextual, you. right? Yeah. You know, it's like maybe you talk to a team where, you know, people just need to know like when and where. You don't mm -hmm. need to, you know, be mm -hmm. like personality driven right, type right, thing. Sure. And then and then there are other <laughs> notes where, you know, and I, I get this 
already sometimes with um, some, you know, AI prompts where it's like works or thanks. Or, <laughs> Sounds great. Know, Sounds good. Yeah. Or I'm like, this is great. Know. Thank you. All of those things sound very <laughs> flippant. Yeah. You know, yeah, if I were right. really to, you know, actually use that to send. But if it was something that could more or less, you know, understand my cadence over time. That's yeah, important. You know, that, I that's thought part about of it. it. But Sarah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I could see, I, I have been thinking I probably am not going to use this, but I could see using it if somebody's like, Hey, did you book the flight? And Gemini suggests like, I will respond with, yes, here are the flight numbers, times and everything. And it, it like, yeah, I don't need to be clever about that. I'm like, you know, totally. punch it up with some dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> I just need the flight times. I'm like, oh, if it can accurately do all that and all I have to do is press a button, that's that will be pretty handy. I will, I will, I will grant you that. Yeah. Yeah. It does, it does kind of make me wonder about how, you know, people, if, if something like the scenario that you described, Tom, works really well, it's like, how much will we actually be talking to each other? But maybe that's, maybe, maybe, maybe the point is we'll talk to each other when we really have to. Yeah. And maybe we'll have more brain power to say say what we mean to say instead of yeah. just yeah. being exhausted from having to type out all those flight times, you know, well, 10 minutes ago. Th yeah. And that that is, I think, also a part of this is that, you know, so often we're communicating on mobile, let's say. Mobile is the prime example in my oh, life yeah. where I hate typing out a long answer or a long email or whatever with my, you know, with a tiny little screen. Mm -hmm. I do it because that's just the paradigm when, when I'm out, of, you know, out somewhere and I need to respond to an email. <laughs> so from that perspective, great, if you can save me a little bit of that in certain circumstances. And I think, Sarah, your point is, is super like on point as far as being in my voice, being in my cadence. And hopefully these things, by, by having the attention on the entire thread, hopefully over time, they can begin to get to the point to where it's like, oh, I totally would have written that. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. That that is me. Like if I had written it, it would have said basically the same thing. So I feel yeah. comfortable hitting. Seven. Yeah, and then we get to the point where it's like, you know, when is the conversation personal enough that this yeah. is not, you know, let's yeah. not do that. You know, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's pretty good for work stuff. But you know, I'm talking to my, you know, Aunt Martha, and she really needs to hear my voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't mind if you use a large language model of your choice to write something on our subreddit. Uh, we just want to hear what you want to hear us talk about. So get those links over there. Vote on the links other people have submitted at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. <laughs> On Tuesday, Google's Chromecast replacement. Goodbye, Chromecast. Hello, Google TV Streamer was released. Jason's been using it since it came out. Uh, he's got a review uh, ready to go and, and lined up. Uh, so he's going to share some of his insights with us today. How is it stacking up to other streaming devices in the market? And for those who are like, oh, I guess I'm switching from Chromecast now? Yeah, I know. It's it's interesting that, that Google is moving away from the Chromecast thing, because as far as its hardware division is concerned, Chromecast could be one of its most successful uh, hardware efforts. You know, it lasted for, uh, well, I, I think over a decade at this point, yeah, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was popular because it was inexpensive. You could hide it away. It's very easy to, you know, cast from your phone to the, the TV. And like the, the streamer, which I happen to have right here, um, does all of those things. You know, it, it's it's basically the next generation. The, the device that this is really an upgrade from is the Chromecast with 4K, or sorry, with Google TV 4K. That is a device that I did not have for review, so I can't compare it side by side. But um, and that one did come with a remote. As you can see, the Google TV streamer comes with a remote. I have to say, like, <laughs> I put in the notes, it's slippery. And in the pre-show, we were all talking about how all remotes are slippery. And I was trying to think, like, well, what is the difference? Why does it matter that this thing is is slippery when all remotes are? And I think it's also the size. Like, it's, it's very ergonomic, but it's just so easy to kind of fall out of your hand, you know, in one case. I also had this slide out of my daughter's uh, attention. <laughs> so maybe that's her her fault and not the remote's fault and into the couch and which mm -hmm. is fine because there's a button on the back of the device that you can hit to do to, to do a find my remote feature. Which uh, so is, that's great. I mean, 
Yeah. Yeah, I can hear that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, pre- it's pretty loud. Yeah, Although if it's covered up it. with a you're gonna find yeah, that remote. Did you find out if it's up with adjustable? A cushion. Can you change the volume of that? Oh, that's a good question. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I hope so because I have heard from some people that when it's tucked away in a cushion, it's still not quite loud enough to uh-huh. get to get out. But I, uh, we did not have that uh, that experience. Uh, it also happened to get uh, caught in the gears of the recliner, and so it got a little chopped up, which is <laughs> but unfortunate. It still works. But you know that's what? Good. Hey, that happened within like a day of using it, which is honestly, with with my history with hardware, pretty much the f- a fact of life. Um, as <clears throat> excuse me, as far as the the streamer OS is concerned, you know this is this is what it is. This is Google TV as it stands right now, and you know Google's big story about this is you know it's got Gemini, it's got generative uh, screen uh, screensaver, so generative art screensaver, and you can install that. I think my one takeaway with uh, you know, just to summarize real quick, that my takeaway on the OS itself is that things look really nice. You know, it's big. It's you know, there's the carousels. There's all this. You know, it's very visual and very modern looking. I mean, but it yeah, is this so fe- noisy. This, feel, this feels like my web OS. Um, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. situation uh, currently yeah. with my LG TV. I mean, it. it Noisy, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's all what, kind of noisy, right? I guess so, but I guess what I mean by that is that when you're thumbing through the interface, I want the interface to to kind of help me find the stuff that I have access to. And what it does is, yes, it presents some of that stuff, but it also presents a bunch of stuff that, you know, from apps that you don't have installed. It's just, there's there's so much all over the place that like sitting down to use that interface to make it easier for me to pick, I don't find that. I still end up going the typical route of just opening the app and finding the thing manually versus Uh using the home screen as like a great recommendation engine. There's just so much everywhere. It's really hard to know where to put your focus and your attention. One of the cool things that Google TV's new version of the OS, which is, you know, kind of the feature, it's not the, it's not exclusive to the streamer, but it's, this is its best home is the home panel uh, for, Mm. for Google home stuff. How did you find Mm -hmm. that? Oh, that's, that's probably one of my favorite uh, features actually. Um, here and I can actually show that if I and oh actually I'll show Go you. Go dox so, yourself. <laughs> first of all, yeah, that's that's a good good point. But I I don't think I have any problem with that. On the remote is this little star button. This is a multifunction button, so you can program it to launch an app. You can program it to turn the uh, to switch the input on your TV set, or you can turn it to summon the home app. Which let me see here. Let me make sure I'm in the right place here. And if I hit that, it pulls up my home panel, and it's basically all of my smart home controls on the side, which I absolutely love. It's, it's, I'm not going to hit this cause then my uh, studio lights will go out, but, um, <laughs> just having it right there is really useful, even though you can get to this stuff on your phone pretty easily. And that's, you know, what you would probably normally do, or we've got hue switch on the wall that we could tap, but having it right there, if I just really want to bring down the lights in the living room while I'm watching TV, it's, it's the tap of a button. And that's one of my favorite features for sure. What about the Google Assistant stuff, the Gemini stuff you talk to? That, yeah, that is a little confusing. Is it any better? Um, I mean, it's it's okay. I mean, well, okay, so the Assistant stuff is the way it always was, and I'm trying uh, to actually okay. find it because there used to be a little row. Can you just hit the mic on the on the remote oh, and true. just talk to yeah, it? Yeah, I can. Um, <laughs> uh, hey, what what movies were was uh, Drew Barrymore in? Which is exactly know. how I would ask that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I don't know I'll, how to talk I'll tell so you, good. you know, no, no, Google, that happens Google to be all the time be with voice assistants. This, yeah. But um, that has been a real hit and miss with me yeah. for, you know, uh, other situations. Yeah. So I think what's confusing to me about the integration here is Assistant is there the way it normally is and has been. Then, but Google's talking up Gemini. And so I think when I first launched it, I was like, oh, so this, this interaction is going to be a little different. It's going to be better. Turns out Ger- Gemini is not actually doing any of that. Assistant ah. is doing the voice in- interaction. Gemini is just offering uh, like summaries and insight into plot summaries and that sort of stuff on a select group of content, kind of the Uh, most popular content across all streaming services. You almost have to like look hard to find it. So I'm not going to do it now. That would be a a total tangent for me. I'd have a hard time finding it. But, um, you know, just a little confusing. Also interacting with the assistant 
even on the little carousel that it gave me, I'm trying to remember one of the examples was, oh, show me free movies. And I did that. And the first example it came back with was Inside Out 2. And I'm like, that one no, ain't free. that just came out on, on rental. <laughs> pretty I'm sure pretty certain yeah. you're not going to get that for free. You know, Another one was what year was Alien, Alien released? And I hit that, and all that came back was a YouTube row with a bunch of videos about Alien, the movie. And yeah. so it's like, all right, well, how helpful is that? Because you didn't even solve my problem, even though that's the question you wanted me to ask this feature to show it off. Yeah. It's very right. strange. Yeah. yeah. Overall, like to wrap it up, uh, yeah. do you like it? <laughs> I mean, over yeah, it might sound like I'm very negative on this yeah, device. Yeah. I actually do enjoy it. It's just some of these things I think need to get worked out. The generative AI screensaver sounds gimmicky, and it kind of is. But I will tell you something. If you have kids, they're going to love it. It's a lot of fun to sit down okay. with them huh. and just be like, well, what do you want to create? And you're doing yeah. it up on the TV set. Um, that's really cool. It is $99. It's almost $100. Uh, it has better internals than the previous versions of the Chromecast. So you do get an upgrade in the hardware. Overall, I like it, but I totally see room for uh, improvement. And the good news is probably a lot of that could come through a software update. So I nice. hope it does. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It d doesn't seem like a bad streamer. I've got one on the way. So I'm, I'm looking nice. forward to, to trying it out as well. Thank you, Jason. When When is your review, yeah. full review going up? I'm working on it pretty hard right now. I'm hoping early next week I'll have it up on the Texploder YouTube channel. Fantastic. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Kenny sent us a message which says, I like the fact that Meta is going to integrate Be My Eyes as a volunteer into the glasses that will help blind and low vision people be hands-free while using the service. This seems to have struck a chord with some folks. Kenny says, they'll still have to be connected to a phone, and the app is on Android and iOS, and they don't have to wait with a phone around anymore and possibly drop it or get stolen. So that's where the, uh, this is going to be more uh, optimal. Kenny says, don't forget, on the Ray-Ban mini glasses, there's a little screen on the inside left lens that shows you notifications. Thank you, Kenny, uh, for the extra insight on that. Really appreciate it. Also, thank you, Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. Len, what have you drawn for us today? Well, you know, I went with the uh, password uh, oh, story. Okay. Um, uh, just because that's something I think we can all, we can, not that anything Jason talked about is nothing we can deal with, but. <laughs> I have a lot of issues with my passwords. I see. And uh, <laughs> this is kind of my look at this. Um, it's like it, all this order and orange juice. Schmenrick. <laughs> Schmenrick 216, Schmenrick 23, Schmen, mm. you know, it's, and then Schmenrick. Yeah, all this to order an orange Julius. Um, it uh, oh, seems like a lot to go Julius. through. Orange Julius. That's oh, really how I miss the yeah. Aren't yes, they, they're super delicious. The DQ Orange Julius they combo. Are. Oh yeah. I order all my all the best Orange Julius on my smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. You know that says a more about me, I think, than anything yeah. else. Um, if Over you're DoorDash. interested in that piece, uh, you can go to my Patreon, patreoncom forward slash len where you can get that immediately if you back me at the DTNS lover level, or you can go to my online store. You can just purchase it right there. You get it immediately and uh, hang it up all over the house. You know, it's going to be great. It's going to be a great wallpaper. So I say go for it. Fantastic. I say go Thank for you, it too. Len. Uh, Jason Howell, such a pleasure to have you on the Thank show today. You. Let folks know where you're up to, wh where, what where you're I'm up, up to, to and, and where they I'm can at. see you. <laughs> 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 well, of course, doing Android Faithful uh, for, for DTNS with uh, the AF crew. We're having a lot of fun with the show there. Um, the stuff that I'm doing for myself can be found at youtube.com slash at Texploder. I uh, got a new episode of the podcast up with Andy Anotko earlier this week. Nice. Like I said, you know, AI inside. And then I've got the, the full review of the Google TV streamer coming early next week. So subscribe and you won't miss it. That's my favorite top line I've seen on YouTube in a while. It's got Sarah, O-Docta, and Andy Anotko all Heck in a row yeah. right there. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's... trifecta of awesome. What's not to love? <laughs> uh, folks, I, I feel like I've found the new roomy, the new quotable, you know? The, the thing where you're like, oh, I know this really like interesting person. You probably never heard of them. They're very quotable. 
Have you ever heard of Steve Jobs? No, never. Uh, yeah, who see, is that? it's a find. Well, I'm going to introduce the world to Steve Jobs in my new top five, uh, where we count down the top five things that Steve Jobs has said. Top five Steve Jobs quotes. Catch it at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok. DTNS picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram, and of course at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. If you're a patron, we are not done. Stick around for good day internet. It's Friday, and Roger in Jason's honor put together a which streaming shows are real and which are fake quiz for us. I cannot wait to play this. Stick around and play along with us, won't you? Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back on Monday talking about iPhone 16 versus Samsung Galaxy S24 to the death with Aya Zaktar joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of the Daily Tech News Show were created by the following humans. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer Joe Kuntz. Producer at large Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadalajara, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Jason Howell. And our guest this week was Nate Langson. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>